Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Overseas Famous Podcast. I'm here with Chelsea Schwears. Chelsea is a pro basketball player, a underdog, and a fighter. And this is one of the coolest interviews because she really is a fighter and she would probably kick every person's ass uh, on and off the court who's listening to this podcast. Chelsea, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's been quite so- a journey thus far. <laughs> It really has. It uh even just to to getting the podcast, I think we uh we talked for a while back in the day and then we kind of came back and it was like the new year and it's been it's been a scramble. We made it work and I'm I appreciate you uh making the time to hop on and talk to us today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. So the cool thing about your story is a lot of people and there's a there's a whole entire there's a lot of articles out. Uh, players playing division two division three and then making it to professional basketball and your story is great because while you're it's a little different in terms of you were you played division you know division three however you did have obviously looks from higher organizations because you were your stats are insane and we'll get into those but let's take us through the beginning of your story where you're in high school uh, you're learning th- this game and you're you're like legitimately dominating the high school level and you're dominating the AAU level. Uh, how important was that when you were, was that something you were thinking about, okay, I want to play division one basketball. Was that a goal that you had when you were going into high school? Yeah, absolutely. It was always division one. I didn't honestly know much about any other division um, and I played varsity as a freshman and so that kind of, again, put the whole div- maybe Division One, Division One, out there. And um, I think my whole thing was I was a question mark to a lot of coaches because I was only about five foot three, like even smaller than that when I first, first got into high school. But then even as a senior, I was maybe 100 pounds soaking wet and <laughs> five foot five. So I was tiny and I didn't grow really until after high school. I grew a few inches when I was in college. And I just think that that put a lot of question out there for a lot of the division one schools was my size. So I think at that age, it kind of taught me to fight even harder um, early on because I knew I was always going to be undersized and I knew I was always going to have to prove myself. And I think looking back on that, that was a big part of me still continuing to fight even when I was at CNU to get to the next level as well. You talked about the underdog mentality and also that late bloomer mentality. And you hit really on something that I've talked about before, which is when you're a late bloomer, when you kind of grow late, which is what I did, which is what a lot of athletes did. We live in a system right now where a lot of athletes would just get passed over and, you know, for anything, even like making, teams and things like that at a at a amateur level because everyone wants to win now and i it's like funny even when i with younger teams like elementary middle school everyone wants to win now and you have these kids who are late bloomers who are getting cut who are not playing who are not developing and you're like their their potential is so much more but we're just living in a win now society and i think that's it's like affecting so i always look at the late bloomers, like I had someone come up to me not too long ago and be like, wow, you know, you went on and played pro. Like, that's crazy. I remember playing in high school. You were good. But like, and I was like, yeah, I got better. Like, that's just what, <laughs> what life is. And I think that's something that, that most people don't realize that late bloomers really, really come on and, and can do great things in their career. And I think a lot of that too has to come along with, I grew up with an older brother. So I was always fighting against his <laughs> friend and I was always small then. So like the whole small thing didn't really discourage me because I'd always been fighting against the boys and playing against the boys. And I just remember my parents always instilling in me to just keep working hard, keep working hard. Cause I know when I didn't go division one and I went division three, like that could have been another opportunity for me to just get down on myself. But instead I thought, no, I'm just going to keep working. That's all I've ever known is to keep working and keep working. Cause even at the division three level, I was tiny. Um, So it wasn't like, you know, I got there and I was a giant, I was still really small. And then I knew I still really wanted to play after college. So it was that same mentality, just keep working hard. You went on to uh, your, you stay close Christopher Newport university, uh and your career there is 
astonishing what the stats are like. And this is why I was, it's, it's just when I was reading these stats, I'm like, holy shit, this is a phenomenal, I don't care how tall, I don't care what you, what level you're at. If you score like 2,869 points in college, like if you score that many points in college, I don't care what it is. You're, you're flat out ridiculous. (laughs) And that's why I loved your story because it's just, you you just went out there and played like you didn't care and you could tell just based on your stats. Like, and it's not like the, you're, you're a ridiculous shooter. Now this will be a little sidetrack, but how many times have you been underestimated by like other people in this world, females, males, when you kind of go out and you're on, on a court and they think they can like outshoot you or outplay you. Has that happened? It, often? it happens often i just was at the gym yesterday and some guy said oh i saw your stats at seeing you like we should play horse and i'm like okay and then i go out there and i completely dominated him like (laughs) like surprise and i'm just like but i can remember walking into seeing you and my coach like being so excited to tell everybody about me and she kept saying like this is our next star this is our next star and everyone was looking at her like what like she's tiny like she's still up all the way up until that moment my coach was even trying to tell people like how excited she was to have me and everyone was kind of like still hesitant um so that I thought that was kind of funny going in but I've always you know even going overseas and the Americans that they're used to you know usually bigger stronger faster and I walk in and they're all just kind of like hey what what's going on with this girl <laughs> so that is a that's a great thing. I I remember doing basketball training when I was still playing and with a girl Christina Fogey who went on a Vanderbilt and like she was quiet and she was sweet and just she was tall but she wasn't like huge yeah. and the boys would go and play against her and I'd be like play up on her and they'd be like look at me and then she would just three 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 and it's just it was always my favorite thing watching I love humbling people. I love doing it as a player. I love like watching it as, uh, you know, as a coach. It's the greatest thing in the world when you humble people. So being able to humble some of these people is it, it's got to give build that confidence and be like, all right, yeah, we're I just kicked your ass. Now I'm going to go on the court and kick their ass. Because okay. when you play against people, like you said, your older brother, and you can whoop up on them, playing against everyone else makes it a lot easier. Exactly. And I think too, that really helped me with my confidence as well going overseas. Cause I can just remember the first time I went, when I went to Greece and I walked in, you could just kind of see the girls were just kind of like, Oh, <laughs> this isn't what we expected. And, but I just still had that same mentality of like, I just need to go out there and prove to them that I belong. And I, you know, I thought after a couple of years of playing overseas that that would like go away and they would like, you know, do some research before I got there. But it always seemed to like every time I walked in, they were just kind of like a little bit hesitant. Isn't that wild? You would think that your name would start resonating. You kind of play against the same group of people, but you would think that your name would resonate when you get there. Like, oh, this is what this dude can do. Oh, this is what she can do. This is what he can do. This is what they can do. Like, always kind of thinking about that but it never really happens like that no one really knows much when you go there and even the fans like they don't really know much they take things that you did in other leagues and like oh okay i see a highlight film but everyone can put together that it's just weird that 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 overseas the the word doesn't travel as well when you when you kind of arrive to a place be like all right this is this is what they do especially amongst the players you would think it's a smaller community that people would know what to expect and you're still kind of proving yourself year after year game after game it's wild it definitely is and that can kind of get discouraging a little bit but I just remember just I was so used to it at that point it was just like all right whatever (laughs) here we go again (laughs) the you've talked about this before but the the career that you had in college really did help propel you into a professional career and I think you know, if people look at your stats and they're like, all right, I, like I said, I don't care what she, where she played, like this girl can play. And did that play a big part in you eventually making it overseas? As you said, going to Greece first uh, and a big time club. Uh, was that something where you were just kind of like, all right, this is, were you shocked a little or were you like, yeah, this is where I belong? No, I I got a shock for sure when I went to Greece. So kind of my senior year at CNU, I was 
getting put more on a national level. And I was starting to watch, you know, I was right neck and neck with Maya Moore for points overall. And I remember everybody talking about us. I was watching her and, you know, obviously realizing that she's on a completely different level. And so I just remember thinking, Hey, I want to play overseas. There's probably going to be girls like that over there. And so I think at that point, I really even started realizing like, I got to bring this up another level. I got to get a little bit stronger. I got to get a little bit faster. And that's when I really started hitting the weight room and getting really serious and watching more film. And because when I was at CNU, it's like, you know, everyone's telling me how great I was. And it's like, yeah, I appreciate that. And, but I knew that I wanted to play at the next level and I knew I was going to have to bring my game up a whole another notch to sustain it. But I was definitely got a shock when I was in Greece. So on the court, off the court, you get to Greece. Uh, you're playing for one of the top teams in Greece. And I, it's funny when I, whenever I say this, I've interviewed like 10 people who played here. And like, I still can't pronounce it. I, it took me like two years to figure out how to say Giannis Antetokounmpo. And it's like, and my wife is is Greek. So it's oh, like, okay. how am I having so much trouble with this? But uh so can you pronounce Panathinaikos. it's like yeah. I, for some reason i i struggle with the greek language a whole lot maybe it's just like a mental block because she's greek that i'm like i'm intentionally going to not know how to pronounce these things but i've interviewed so many people from there and i just i every time i'm like um drawing a blank on how to how to pronounce this so anyway going back into it you go to a top team in greece uh you arrived there Greece is incredible it's an incredible place were you when you walked in we talked about you know you everyone's like okay who's this how was that confidence to get on the court and just be like I belong was there that moment that you kind of set up where you're just like okay I got I got this I belong here yeah and I would say it definitely wasn't when I first walked in I just think with the language barrier the girls just I came in halfway through the season. I wasn't sure what they expected. And um, I get there and, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm Chelsea. Like everyone would know I'm all seeing you. And I get there and I remember telling somebody I went to Christopher Newport and they're like, oh, is that the governor? Like, what is that? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, here's another piece of humble pie. So then I just got to work. And I remember it was a little bit of a roller coaster at first, you know, trying to learn the offense. And, you, you know, the language barrier was a whole other issue. And I just think, when you're around people that aren't speaking your dominant language, that can be a little bit of a setback. And I would say it took me probably a couple of weeks to really get adjusted and to really feel like myself out there. The three point line was like a good two feet further behind. And, you know, I'd been working on that at home, but then again, you get bigger, faster, stronger girls defending you. That took a little time to adjust, but I would say a couple of weeks and I would kind of settled in. I think what you just brought up was, is such a key point to, an adjustment that not many people think about going overseas. We think about like the travel, we think about the adjustment to the language, the coaches, the different styles, the quicker, faster, but the having to adjust your game in terms of like how far away things are. And especially for a shooter like yourself, I kind of was able to go inside more. So I didn't really have as much of an issue, but the step back, I remember when I went to the G league, we were stepping back in the three point line. It's the, the NBA three point line. And it just, it's weird how much further away it seemed when you're shooting. And it, it seemed like <laughs> a mile away. It seemed so far at first. It's wild. You just, you're looking and it, it almost plays mind games with you because you're just, you're stepping back and you're like, all right, I got this. And you're like, holy shit, like look how much further back I am. You just have to kind of adjust your game. And was that something when you kind of stepped on the court, you're like, all right. You obviously have practiced it, but when that line's there and you know that it's there, was that a, a, something that you were like, all right, let's 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 figure so, this out? For sure. And I definitely didn't shoot as high a percentage as I was used to that first season in Greece. And like you said, you're just like, holy shit, the basket is so <laughs> far away. And again, it's different when you're kind of like wide open, you just catch and shoot one, you know, and then all of a sudden people start learning that you can shoot the ball so you're not open anymore and like that was a whole nother thing, you know, shooting step backs, you know, two feet further behind that took a whole, you know, I probably took a season to adjust to that, honestly. Um, but it was fun. Going from Greece and uh, we have a lot of Australia talk. I played in Cairns for a year. It was my favorite place in the world that I ever played. Uh, so 
we're I'm excited about the Australia t- talk. So you go over to Australia and there's two different leagues in the Australia. There's almost like the the summertime. I, it's weird because we say summertime, they're yes, winter time. They're winter. So like uh, they're with their summertime league and then our wintertime league, they're just different. Uh, they're different time periods. But you went over there, end up in Australia, and you have a long career in Australia, which is the dream of every overseas athlete. You live that dream. So take us your initial step to get to Australia. So after Greece, I was kind of just a little bit homesick, you could say. I think just that being my first time ever out of the country, the language barrier, and I was just kind of hesitant a little bit about going back. And I remember talking to some people and, you know, my trainer kind of saying, hey, like, why don't you try Australia? It's America. It's further away, but it's more Americanized. People speak English. I think you'll kind of settle in a little bit better. And I started doing some research on Australia. And obviously, it's like one of the most beautiful places in the world. So I was like, yeah, like, I'm going to try to go there. And um, I remember when I signed my first contract, it was actually in a place outside of Brisbane called Toowoomba. It was pretty much in the middle of nowhere, honestly. But I remember like my first weekend there, they took me to the Gold Coast, the beach, and it was just beautiful. And I just remember settling in. And for some reason, I don't know if they did a lot of research on me or what, but those girls believed in me from the very first step that I got there. And that really did boost my confidence. And um, they were just a great group of girls. My coach was amazing. Um, I played really well. And Obviously, I fell in love with Australia, and I really wanted to go back, and that's kind of how it all started for me in Australia. It is one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and then you mentioned the Gold Coast, which is paradise. Uh, the just your you talked about your initial reaction. You talked about how you walked in, and the the thing about Australia is it really is the furthest away you can be from home. But oddly, you don't get as homesick as you do in some European countries because it's such a different world there. In Australia, it's very similar to the United States. So you have a lot of the same things. The thing, the things are there. People are speaking English and you forget how far away you actually are. And it's a weird mindset to go there because you, you're, you're like a day away from home. But at the same time, you feel more at home than you do in a lot of European cities. And it's just, I guess, the the culture. I guess it's a very similar culture. But I always thought that was weird when I was there. I didn't miss home. And no. when I was, I, I'm like a four-hour flight away from home and I'm missing it. And then I'm like a 27-hour flight and I'm like, I don't miss anything. Dude, that's so crazy you say that because I was the exact same way. Like when I was in Australia, like I never missed home. I remember sometimes like, you know, because you – when you're trying to communicate back home with the time difference, you're thinking, Oh, I wonder what time it is. And like, you know, in Europe, you're like, Damn, I miss home. And like, I miss what they're doing. But when you're in Australia, it's like, yeah, they were, I think we're 15 hours ahead, but you don't, you really don't miss home. It's like, it is so weird. I think it is a lot. Cause you see a lot of familiar things and like everybody talking and speaking English. Cause I remember being in Europe and you're out to dinner or whatever with your teammate and there's five or six tables around you. And like, you literally like, can't even understand what they're they're all talking but you have no idea like what's going on I just remember that being so weird like even landing back in America it was kind of like damn I, I don't even care what all these tables around me are saying anymore but now you can understand them so I don't know I just remember all of that like it being a massive sensory overload landing back in the states after Europe from being able to understand everybody and but in Australia just not missing home and like you said it being so Americanized and yeah, it's weird. Even you drive on the other side of the road, but it's still like feels like America. <laughs> it's so weird. It does take an adjustment. I I think about the the I was in I forget where I was, either maybe Kosovo and just hearing someone speak a different language for so long and then I flew back home and landed in America and it's like I'm in Philadelphia getting off the plane and I hear like the baggage claim guys arguing like f this and f this and i'm like oh it's good to be home like it's just weird those even the people who are hating on life right now you're like ah they're speaking english i can get i can get down with this it is and like not having to try to like get wi-fi or like better service your phone just works everywhere (laughs) i remember that (laughs) like so exciting like 
Um, that is a uh, and everything's different now i guess like the phones like you said the wi-fi and there's people with international plans like i remember going because i'm old like i'm 42 so when i would go i remember like shutting my cell phone off and knowing i wasn't going to use it again for 10 months and then they would give me a cell phone and i remember like not being able to talk to it was it's a it's a crazy thing so now you kind of have the wi-fi in your phone you're like all right i can still facetime and i can still talk to people but what an adjustment! What a technology, technological, techno. It's like fucking Panathinaikos. and I spelled it. I said it again wrong. I'm bad at pronouncing words, apparently. But I just, I think it is. It's such an adjustment when you kind of head head far away in the phones and things like that. So it is nice to to kind of return home. So you go to Australia. You have a great year. Was that something where you're just like, I could stay here forever? Absolutely. Right out of the gate. I knew for sure. 100%. I was set. I wanted to go back. And I remember because I played in their winter. So my summer, so then it was coming up, I could go back to Europe. And I remember wanting to give Europe another chance because I had gotten so much confidence, like being in Australia and being American, like we talked about. And I just think I really didn't want to give up on Europe either because I knew people like loved it and had a great time there. And, you know, that I think I kind of matured more when I was in Australia and got a little bit more confidence. And I remember really still wanting to go back and give Europe another try. Um, But I always knew that I was going to return back to Australia. It is a Sophie's choice situation anytime you go because you you have such a small window of opportunity and you're trying to make as much money and you're trying to be as successful as possible. And sometimes I ended up chasing the money and it ended up screwing me in the end. Uh, but when you find a place you like, I always tell athletes now, like when you find a place you like, if you're happy, if they're paying, if the basketball is good and you're making money, like, you know, maybe you can make a few extra thousand here, but I feel like the happiness plays such a determination in an overseas basketball player's life. And we try to try to chase things. And when we should just kind of, you know, look at what's going to make us happy, what's going to make us play the best. Cause I knew probably the same thing with you. Like, if I wasn't happy in my situation where I was, I wasn't going to be performing as well in the court. Like my, I was doing great in Australia because I was so happy every day. And some places you're just not as happy and it, it affects how you're playing on the court. Oh, well, I'm a big time believer too. Now that I know that I'm deeply affected by the weather. Like I went to Australia oh, yeah. <laughs> and I had beautiful weather and I was like so happy and I'm outside all the time and I'm, you know, walking around, you see people with their dogs, everybody's exercising. It's sunny 90% of the time. And I realized that being there that I was really affected by the weather. And like you said, you know, those are things that you have to start taking into consideration when contracts are coming in and, you know, cause then I did play, I went to Iceland twice. Iceland I had an amazing time there like they loved me in Iceland they treated me treated me great and then um I broke my hand in the dark days of the sun you know rising at 11 30 and setting at three like really took its toll on me and I wasn't able to play because my hand and you know I remember feeling like damn this is like this is tough like there's nothing to do outside it's either raining or snowing or sleeting you know 22 hours a day but um, but the people there in Iceland were so great to me. And I think that definitely helped. But I just remember thinking to him, Australia, you know, was so warm, so sunny. Um, I could get outside and exercise, things like that. I knew really affected me and made me happy in life. And like you said, that carries on to the court. People always get mad at LeBron when he went to Miami. And as a player, I felt like like the fans don't get it. As a player, you're like, I get it. I get wanting to go to a place where you're you're the weather's great all the time it, it does it, it gives you a different mental state and why would you want to go somewhere where you're just kind of like uh every day and like you said there's great places like iceland great people it's just it's just tough like the weather the weather yeah. wears on you i feel like estonia like there's different places where it snows all the time and I, you're just driving every day and you're wiping snow off and it's just it gets old it gets tiring it gets like depressing because i mean that's why all these famous po poets wrote all these poems about being depressed in the winter it's like it makes sense now when you're all by yourself in a foreign country and it's snowing 10 inches I, every day. right and i remember being overseas and one of the main things i really learned was like work-life balance because in college it's like 
oh, if you're not going to weights and you're not going to individuals and you're not on the shooting machine, you're not grinding, you're, you're, you know, you don't want it bad enough. But then it's like, you go to Europe and it's like, you see work-life balance a lot more. And, you know, there is things outside of basketball and you don't have to do basketball 15 hours, you know, a day. And I think we go back to like the weather and all, all that. It's like, those were the things I was able to get outside and not think about basketball and do other things. And I think that also really helped me, you know, with other things. My mind wasn't just like, oh my goodness, we lost the game. My whole life is, takes me a week to get over it. Cause there was other things to do and focus on. And I think that really helped my mental state as well. I love the, the, everything that you have done uh, in terms of your career and then your mentality and then that underdog mentality. Uh, you've created this brand of you that has now transcended into your post-career life where you have, you know, fitness and you have uh, a lot of people who, who want your opinion on, on a lot of different things. You've, it's a very difficult thing for an athlete to do, to take what they did during their career and transform it into something where they can be successful post-career. Was that something you gave thought to while you were playing of like, all right, what's my next step? Was that something you were thinking about in the back of your mind? I think I was towards the end of my career at the beginning of it. I think I was just still so caught up in basketball, basketball, <laughs> basketball. You don't, you think it's going to last forever. And um, I would say the last few years um, I still had the younger girls really looking up to me after games, you know, wanting to talk to me and their parents wanted me to train them. And I think, you know, because of my size and stuff, they see their self in me. And I think that really made me want to start thinking about what I was going to do after and how I would give back, you know, in some way, even if I didn't want to be a coach or something like that. And I think that kind of pushed me more into the fitness realm as well. Um, just inspiring young girls to want to be strong and, you know, and that's for, I think that's for sport and off the court. I think, you know, when you're strong and you believe in yourself and you stand up for something, um, that that really pushed me into the fitness world as well and that was a an avenue that I could still relate to young athletes that wanted to either go pro or it doesn't matter be better in their high school situation whatever it was you took on you played in Australia you spent you know multiple years there it was a terrific career you're very well known in Australia because of what you've done uh you've had that what's the word I'm looking you've had the the ability to play on the same team for multiple years which is hard to do in overseas basketball and your name was so respected that you were able to continue playing uh on you know similar the same team for for a while which is really hard to do and then you head to Portugal now, kind of going to the weather, now that I'm thinking about it, not going to the weather, was that something that kind of helped with that decision? You're like, I'm not going here, but uh, Portugal, I'm okay with. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the first season I played in Portugal was on an island called Funchal Madeira. And it's literally like Hawaii. It's an island that um, Cristiano Ronaldo's from. Um, so obviously I did a little research and I'm seeing that it's mild weather and it's right on the water, obviously. And those things are obviously very enticing to me. So when that offer came through, it was obviously a no brainer for me at the time. Um, so I was just going to go there and play that season and then go back to Australia. Um, so it was amazing. I had a great time. My teammates were awesome. The weather was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed myself there as well. So what was that moment when you were kind of like, all right, I feel like this is, this is starting to, this is starting to wear on me. This is the, because we all get to that moment playing where we're kind of like, oh, all right, yeah. this is, this is starting to, this is, this is hurting my soul yeah. doing this so, every day. I was 26, almost 27. And I was in Madeira and I broke my nose and I tore a ligament in my hand in the same season. And I was just kind of like, this sucks bad. Like I'm trying to play with a mask on. It's I broke my nose, I think literally two days after they were allowed to exchange Americans. So they were stuck with me. They were pissed. Um, the doctor was saying, you know, four to six weeks. 
and but playoffs were going to start in like four weeks so they're obviously you know you know hey, yeah we'll give you like three days and you need to get back out there so I'm trying to play with a mask on I'm frustrated um the mask is sliding I think it like fit somebody else's face and they kind of like tried to you know make it work for me and I was like man this sucks like my face hurts my hands jacked up like now you know and I think at that point I was kind of just like yeah I don't really know how much longer I'm gonna do this and (laughs) after that season I did I stopped I coached for a season it was like seven months at eight months at William and Mary a division one mid-major in Virginia and just realized really quickly that that was not for me that's it is it is funny when I I have so many people that get into coaching and some of them love it and then some of them are like nope it's not for me like it's just especially like college coaching I think it's just it gets tough uh it's a lot of a lot of work a lot of responsibility you don't see your family anything like that but it's it's a grind and we're used to it but I just think you know it's it's not for everyone (laughs) and like coaching was probably 20 percent of the job on Mm -hmm. coaching it's everything else that just kind of weighs on you and wears on you and so I did that for a season and then I was healing up obviously nicely gave myself a nice like you know six seven month break and my body was feeling great started getting a couple contracts coming through and I was like, this is no, I'm out. I'm going back to play. So that's kind of how that went. Nice. So you, the Sydney flames, they had, you know, a huge love for you, fan base, fan clubs, kids loved you. Uh, I watched some videos of just, you know, people talking about you and, and how respected you are uh in these in these areas uh your name still resonates in australia is that something uh, it's funny because when you you were just like i'm in florida now i'm like that's a good call i was like okay now now <laughs> i know now i understand but the the kind of the australia it's when you play there it's weird because i played there and i was like oh, i'll be back here all the time and i have not been back to australia since I stopped playing and it's something that I'm like, all right, I have to do it, but it's just, it's difficult. It's far. It's 20 something hours away. I haven't been back either. Yeah. Is that something you're planning on the future to be like, I need to. Yeah. I say it every summer and Mm -hmm. um, it kind of, you know, happened abruptly when I didn't go back because of the lockout with like the pandemic and not allowing Americans. So I was already signed to go back there. And then the pandemic obviously happened and, that was rough for me. I was in a dark place when I found out that like it kept because it kind of kept getting pushed back like, hey, you can't go in December, but we're looking at January, February, March, April. And then it was like, you know, obviously they're canceling the season. And I remember just being so like upset, like my life was there. I mean, I left an entire suitcase full of all my stuff. It's still there to this day in my friend's house that I still haven't gotten back yet. Um, so I just remember, you know, thinking, Hey, I'm going back there. And then when I couldn't, it was, it was just a terrible feeling. And then I got the offer to go to Portugal the second time and, um, kind of play through a pandemic season. And I just, that was so hard to like mm-hmm. everything being locked down. Like I remember the last five months I was in Portugal, there were no fans or nothing. The only thing that was open was a grocery store and gas stations. And I had a tough decision, you know, was, Australia wasn't open that summer, but it was going to be the following year. And I just kind of decided that I didn't want to do another season in Europe under the COVID restrictions. And those those were kind of still. So back to what you're saying, I definitely still do need, want to get back to Australia. A lot of my friends are, are there obviously. Um, I just haven't yet, but I will for sure get back there. I was, I, I had thought about doing this when I was playing, which is so stupid, but I was like, I should, I don't know why, maybe I'm a sentimental human being, but I'm like, I should leave something in each country that I ever play in. And I never did because then I was just like making sure, double checking, but I was like, I should have left something like in the walls and stuff. I don't know what that would, what that would ever do, but it's just a fun thing to be like, oh, well, my blueprint, my imprint is, is all over the world. 
but yeah it, yeah, it never ended up happening. But you kind of have that with Australia. You still have some stuff there. So that's yeah, <laughs> and I kind of got so I have a few tattoos. They're little ones, but I kind of started off by getting them like in all the places that I was like going to play in, and I got a few overseas as well. So I remember that kind of being like, I'm gonna get a tattoo of like something that resembles everywhere I went. But then I played for so long, I kind of stopped doing that. <laughs> <laughs> covered up in tattoos, but that's kind of yeah. similar similar kind of idea because I remember like you you know you're in a headspace and a mind space of what's going on like when you're in each country and kind of reminds me of you know where I was and how far I've come from that there as well so it's kind of similar so you end up uh you know the pandemic comes and it's a lot of a lot of people fell into this route because especially the I don't and especially because it's great that you brought that up especially the veterans who were going into another year and they kind of already already were at that point where like oh this is this is annoying and then you have covid and you have these restrictions and it's not the same season and th- you don't know if you're going to be able to play your next game if you're going to be sent home yeah there's a pandemic and like your family's home and that makes it even more of a homesick opportunity uh, situation and i know a lot of players who are like all right i'm done this is this is all so you go through that situation. You're like, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to Europe and dealing with this. What was your next thought process? I literally remember being in Portugal, finishing out the season. The contracts are coming through for next year in Europe, and they're still saying no fan. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. What, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I'm like, I've tried the coaching thing. I really don't want to do that. And, um, Honestly, I was sitting in all um in Portugal and I was watching um some NBA games because obviously all we had to do we there was nothing to do. We were sitting out because a lot, you know, somebody test positive now we're home back for 14 days. So I was like doing a lot of um social media and there was a situation in an NBA game where there was two female referees for the first time ever in the history and I don't know. For some reason that day, I thought to myself, maybe I'll referee. Maybe I'll try to get into refing. And then, you know, I was kind of like, man, I haven't really been the best to referees the last, you know, (laughs) time overseas. And I started thinking, oh, maybe not. Maybe so. I don't really know. Then I get home and I kind of realized that there was some referees like in my area in Virginia where I was and I went to a couple referee camps and I've been on this new refereeing journey since. So it'll be another ride, another, you know, crazy journey, I'm sure. But I'm learning a lot from officiating and it's kind of like being on the other side now, but I'm still on the court. So it's weird because it's almost like more similar to playing because I'm actually still running up and down the court and um I kind of you know look at it as giving back to the game and I'm out there to keep the game equal and make sure everybody's got a fair shot and so I'm enjoying it but I never in a million years thought I would (laughs) I I 100% understand that because I know how I treated referees and I'm like man like I would not want to be treated like that. But at the same time, I understand what you're saying. Like you're so close to the game still. And it gives you that, like that up and down, you're on the court, you're in the action. I think I like that aspect of it. It's just, and is it funny when you, like now that your perspective, you're seeing things through a referee's eyes, isn't it funny what like how you saw certain plays that you're like, why didn't they call this? What would like this is obvious? And we always use the word obvious on the sideline or playing. Like it's obvious. I felt them hit me. But as a referee, like you look at it from a different perspective and you can kind of see, you know, how different it is to to see these calls and be like, no, that's that's nothing. And there's so many things you're focusing on as well um, while refereeing and trying to get the play right as well. I honestly think it might have might made me a better player now. Like if I went back to play <laughs> after having refereed a little bit and kind of seeing the game from another perspective and another, you know, from a different angle. And you just don't realize though as a player, like how much referees have going on and how hard it is. So I obviously now being on the side, have a whole new level of respect for the officials and how hard it is. Um, But yeah, I do, you know, 
kind of see now how, you know, oh, I don't know how they didn't see that. Well, now I know how they didn't see it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of wish I could take back a couple of things I probably said to a few officials along the way. <laughs> But Last it's all part of it. Hey, now, yeah. now they give, now they say it to me, and I get, I, I get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. You don't internalize it because you're just like, all right, you know, you didn't internalize as a player. You're just like, that sucks, and then you just walk away, and you didn't think yeah. about it again. So as a referee, it must be nice to kind of have that perspective to be like, they didn't mean it. They didn't yeah, mean it like exactly. that. They're not really being that person. And I definitely think my career and playing such a high level as a player has definitely helped me transition into refereeing and kind of seeing the next play and getting a step ahead just from my knowledge of the game. So it's been good. It's been fun. That's great. Last question is the 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 surfing. Did you get into surfing before Australia or was Australia like a push in the surfing direction? Um, it was definitely a push in the surfing direction. I've surfed a couple of times before. I was really big into wakeboarding, believe it or not, in the high school. And then when I went to Australia and they were all surfing, there was a lot of bunch of surf schools and stuff going on. And I just, you know, picked it up there. That's the crazy thing about Australia is like I, li I lived up in cans and like legitimately you stepped a toe in the water like 30 things were Trump coming to kill you yeah so when you as you go further south like there's there's still things that are going to get you but not as not even close to can yeah I just it, remember them having shark nets up but the shark nets were like 25 meters i'm like dude yeah. the sharks are just gonna swim right around and come like, like am i missing something like the shark net doesn't go the whole distance of the beach it's kind of just like oh yeah they're just you're safe in this like two feet of water but <laughs> they'll swim around if they want to i'm like okay <laughs> like, yeah there's just it's it's they everything was like a deterrent like you had the box jellyfish and yeah. the stingers and they're just like oh yeah like these things are there to stop but then they would sink down and you'd see jellyfish just go over and be like, well, I'm not even going to go in the water here. I'm the pool's fine. I'm, I'm completely fine with that. It's just, it's a wild place over there. I remember seeing a, a it's called a red back spider. Cause it's literally just got a red line down its back. And if it bites you, like you have to go to the hot, you have a certain amount of time to get the hot spot. <laughs> I remember sitting in practice and the ball must have rolled under my seat. And I look under there and there's like a huge red back spider, like underneath my seat on the bench. And I'm just like telling somebody like, yeah, yeah. Just leave it there. It's going to kill all the other insects. And like, as long as you don't mess with it, like we don't mess with, you know, it won't mess with you and it's all good. And so we don't kill it. We still sit in the same seat. Like it's all, it's fine. <laughs> just, just leave it alone, mate. Don't touch it. Yeah. They're bred very differently over there. Yeah. I guess that's what it is when legitimately like 90% of the things out there could kill you. Like we're used to squirrels and things like that. Right. And I don't, I would get, I like touched this girl one time. Cause it was like in, it was like caught in my, the one part of my house and I had to like grab it. It was the scariest thing I've ever been a part of. It's a freaking squirrel. I'm like, these people over there are like picking up huge spiders and just tossing them aside. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it <laughs> it's creepy. But yes, it's been a journey. It has. And Chelsea, we really appreciate you hopping on the podcast today, talking, uh, telling your story, telling some fun stories and just, you know, shooting the shit about basketball. You are a true sure. underdog and uh, you, what you've done with your career is impressive. And we are really excited to see what the future holds for you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This is so much fun. You're a blast. Thanks. <laughs> well, this has been the Overseas Famous Podcast. We'll see you guys next week.